Hello and welcome wherever and whenever you're joining us from. Thank you for being here. My name is Molly Rosenberg and I'm director of the Royal Society of Literature. I have the great pleasure of introducing this, the second transatlantic conversation in a series we're presenting with our friends live from NYPL, the premier cultural programming series at the New York Public Library. This exciting collaboration brings our institutions together to combine our audiences and revel in something which we all have in common, a love of literature. Our first event together was last year when RSL President Bernadine Evaristo spoke to Britt Bennett. It's a brilliant discussion, uh, which you can still watch back online. So you can just go to the NYPL's website uh, and YouTube channel. Continuing in this strain of excellence, uh, I'm delighted to say that today RSL fellow Jeff Dyer will be speaking to Chloe Cooper-Jones to discuss their latest books, The Last Days of Roger Federer and Easy Beauty, uh, and much more besides. Both titles explore sporting matches and everyday battles, failure and triumph, what it means and what it takes to live life to the full, and when and how to bow out. Jeff Dyer is uh, an award-winning author of four novels and numerous non-fiction books, including Out of Sheer Rage, Yoga for People Who Can't Be Bothered to Do It, and Seesaw. A fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Jeff lives in Los Angeles, where he is writer in residence at the University of Southern California. His books have been translated into 24 languages. Chloe Cooper-Jones is a philosophy professor and journalist based in Brooklyn, New York. She's a contributing, contributing writer for the New York Times magazine, a white and creative nonfiction grant recipient, and in 2020 was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in feature writing. I'll hand over to them in just a moment, but first I want to tell you a bit more about what's coming up for the RSL and NYPL while I've got you as an audience. The Royal Society of Literature is a charity which celebrates writing and reading of all kinds, supporting writers at every stage of their career and particularly the challenging moments. We're in the middle of our spring season of events uh, with upcoming highlights, including an event in memory of Hilary Mantel um, and Zadie Smith in conversation about Virginia Woolf as part of our Dalloway Day celebrations. You can find out more on our website, rsliterature.org. This international event is also as good a time as any to mention the RSL's International Writers Programme, which is open for recommendations now. The programme recognises the contributions of writers across the globe to literature in English. Being an RSL international writer is a lifelong honour, forming an ever-expanding global community of authors featuring the likes of Anne Carson, Kim Hysoon, Ngugi Wationgo and Jamaica Kincaid. Find out more about how to recommend writers on our website and anyone anywhere can recommend. Meanwhile, uh, live from NYPL, they've got events in the weeks ahead, including a happy hour featuring Words Without Borders, author talks with Matthew Desmond and Nana Kwame Adjay Brenya, and a lecture from Sherilyn Ifill, just to name a few. To register, sign up and get on their newsletter, um, head to nypl.org slash live. Live from NYPL is made possible by the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, Manaz Ispahani Bartos and Adam Bartos. Right, back to the matter at hand. Chloe and Jeff are keen to take some of your questions towards the end of their discussion today, uh, which you can send at any time via the chat function or by emailing publicprograms at mypl.org. All that remains for me uh, to do is to thank the entire Live from NYPL team for everything they've done to make this event possible. And of course, to thank you all for tuning in, uh, for supporting the RSL, the NYPL and literature around the world. Over to you, Chloe and Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hello, Chloe. Hi, great. We're going well technologically, at least so far, aren't we? I think so far, so good. <laughs> Thank you, Molly, for that great introduction. And thanks to the New York Public Library for having us. And um, so, Jeff, we agreed that 
uh, we'd start by I get to tell the story of of how we met and how that meeting is I, I so rudely and without your permission wrote about actually in in my book and then uh, you get to tell your version of it if okay. if you want a rebuttal <laughs> but um, <laughs> Jeff actually plays a huge role in in a very pivotal moment of of my book I most of my book is a travel log in which each chapter takes place in a different city and. Um, I went to Indian Wells, California in my first assignment as a tennis journalist. And throughout that experience, I was, uh, well, I was the worst. I was the worst tennis journalist of, of all time, um, largely because I didn't know a single thing about uh, what I was doing. And so I was just in a constant state of failure. But I had made one good decision, which is I had brought Jeff's book, White Sands, with me. And I was reading it every single night in my hotel room as I was also ruminating on all the ways I had embarrassed myself in front of Rafa Nadal that day or or had accidentally turned on the flashlight on my phone and, and had, um, you know, blinded a tennis player as they're trying to serve. And But I would read Jeff's book and it was so... Uh, I had been a huge fan of your work for so long, but I knew that I needed that book with me as a sort of shield of courage in a way, because something that I have always admired about your work is how you will really allow mistakes to be the story, or you'll be unapologetic about your curiosities or your, your right to sort of be in a space and thinking about the things that are happening in that space. And so I, I did this like sort of, you know, intense, um, Sort of, I don't know, mental project of just pretending I was you and and walking <laughs> through Indian Wells going, well, you know, Jeff Dyer would see this situation as funny. He would figure out a way to write about it. And, and I could, you know, how would he, what would Jeff Dyer do? And then as I was there, I started thinking I was seeing you everywhere. And I thought <laughs> the mind is such a strange thing. You can hallucinate Jeff Dyer whenever, whenever you want. And then we were in a, I was in a press conference, I believe with Roger Federer after he maybe had beaten Nadal on his way to winning that tournament um, in such spectacular fashion. And I thought, I see someone I think is you, and I just follow you like I'm in a dream until finally you turn around and it's you. And I sort of, you know, I was so overwhelmed and also felt very surreal. It was sort of one of those moments that felt like it was breaking reality for me. And I think I just said, you're here. So, you know, <laughs> I've, I've made you appear to guide me through this, this sort of absolute humiliating, um, horrible experience of, of being the world's worst tennis journalist. Uh, but you were extraordinarily kind to me. And I remember one of the first things you said, I mean, I have so many questions that come from, from this encounter and I want to let you tell your version of it. But I remember one of the first things you said is, you know, I just said, why, you know, why are you here? And I knew you were a tennis fan, but I was wondering why you'd come to this tournament. And you'd said, well, I like to be just near Roger. And I thought that was, I mean, I completely understood it on such a deep level because I felt the same, but I don't think I had the presence of mind to ask you at that time. So I'll ask you now is, um, what do you think just the the sheer presence or the sheer proximity to greatness, um, what do you think that does for you and and why Roger specifically was somebody that that created a sort of singular charge that could only be sort of accessed through proximity? Yeah, uh, well, Chloe, I'll, I'll certainly answer that question. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's quite a lot to unpack here. I mean, <laughs> and we need to start with something extraordinary, I think, which is, I mean, I find it almost hard to believe that we're actually talking about 2017, which my maths isn't great, but somehow that's ended up being six years ago. I mean, what what what's happened to those six years? It seems like just, I don't know, maybe six months ago. So that's an extraordinary thing. I mean, obviously, the, the pandemic wiped out three years. Um, but um, le, I mean, so, um, yes, yeah, so um, I read your book, of course, and um, I saw that there, and I was reading it once I realized that I was making an appearance at this tournament with a gathering 
sense of suspense and dread because <laughs> of course one of the fun things about your book is that uh, as you're um uh, as you're making your way through this um these various encounters i mean people are treating you so poorly um you know really quite quite disgracefully uh, particularly these hardened, these seasoned sort of tennis uh, reporters, and there are you, an outsider, and you're sort of in danger of sort of pissing in their pot, as it were, which no one, no one likes. And so I thought, oh my God, if the, you know, I thought it, I'm going to emerge from this like a total jerk, surely. Uh, and I was just so waiting for the moment when I would say, especially given our extreme height differential, I thought, oh my God, she is. <laughs> The re, you know, she's I'm she's setting me up here, and then, you know, to my great relief, I really do emerge. You know, not only unscathed, but as kind of yeah, with with, with flying colours. So I'm very grateful to to you uh, for for that, and I wonder if it's something that, um, uh, on reflection, maybe it's not that surprising that uh, I emerge okay, because maybe you share my sense that w w I have this real thing of, it's a matter of honor in my uh, books when I write about real people that I've encountered and nobody's ever objected. And that matter of principle for me is that nobody can appear in my books looking worse than me. So we'll, yeah. uh, we'll maybe we'll come back to that as well in, in a moment, because I don't want to lose sight of this, uh, this important bonding experience that we had of <laughs> Proximity to Roger. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this was 2017, uh, of course, just to provide a bit of context for people who aren't tennis nuts when, you know, Roger had been really in the deep twilight for a, for a long while. And then he recovers from knee surgery, amazingly wins the Australian Open in one of the, the, the greatest finals against Nadal. And then he's at Indian Wells, which is a stepping stone, another stepping stone, it turns out, to uh, winning in Miami and then winning Wimbledon. So it's Roger's great, great, re re you know, return to, uh, uh, to, to the top. And yes, I was very excited to see him. And I particularly remember that press conference where we were together. And I was there with my friend who was, um, you know, I was about, I was in my late 50s there. And my friend was in his mid fifties, and these tennis press conferences—they're extraordinary, really, for the amazing lack of charm that these players bring to these occasions. And they, you know, they have to do it, and it's boring for them, and people ask pretty, pretty silly questions, whatever. But um, Roger appeared, and as you know, compared with say Nadal. Um, you know, Roger looks pretty, he does, you know, he's not got that imposing physique, it seems. But when he entered the room, I mean, physically, he was just this Greek god. And I so remember that my friend and I, these two sort of late middle-aged guys, we sort of went, oh, like we were teenage girls in the presence of Justin Bieber or something, even though that's probably an archaic reference now, and there's somebody <laughs> more of a more, more sort of teen appropriate. But yeah, that being in um, close proximity to him was an even more intense affirmation of that which you get seeing Roger play live. Because on TV, it does really look effort, uh, effortless. But when you're seeing him playing, you're realizing that there's an enormous amount of muscular propulsion behind that grace. And then you see him up close and you realize that, well, of course, he's a supremely fit, uh, fit athlete. So that was uh, that was important to us. Um, and also then. I mean, during that press conference, he was he was charm itself. I mean, he was funny and, you know, um, but anyway, back to you, Chloe, because um, unlike me, you've not only been in a room with Roger, you've actually spoken to him. Mm -hmm. So he, how yeah, was that? It was great. He he yeah, he is somebody who really changes the air around him. Um it, just as you're saying, I mean, I feel like even the most seasoned journalists were really sitting up uh, with a different sort of attention. And, you know, he, you mentioned earlier, like a lot of my book is, I think at its core is 
about looking at different models of ways of being. And sometimes those models that are reflected back to me are um, are negative, right? They're models that are that are critical of me or prejudice or or showing me some form of limitation. I think, you know, you you come off well in the book because I'm, you know, I'm sort of using you somewhat unfairly because I, of course, didn't know you as a real person at that time. So I say, I guess I was using your literature um, as an opportunity to rethink how I could live in the world, to take a lesson from it um, and, and to try it on as a way of seeing the world. And for that, I was very grateful because it gave me um, this sort of bravery to think of, you know, I think, yeah, mistakes as the story itself, um, tension as as the thing to write up into rather than to try to avoid. And I think Roger too gave me a model of that and several other sort of strange mentors throughout the quest that is um, my book. And I think one of the ways that he really, you know, one of the the, the things I tried to, to take on um, is after he won the Australian Open, as you're saying, he came back from injury, it seemed like the end. Um, and he came back and he won the Australian Open. And one of his interviews, he said, and this is sort of a cliche thing, in and of itself, or it's a deeply cliche thing in and of itself to say, but in the context um, of a life, especially a life looking at possibly the end of, of a major chapter was a really profound thing and a, and an and a invitation for me to, to try to take this on is he said, I just tried to play free every point. I just tried to play free. And he really did seem like you know, there was a freedom in the way he was, a, he could reinvent himself, he could reinvent his backhand, because he really didn't have anything to prove anymore. Um, and I thought, I wonder if I can go into certain situations and what is a, you know, travel log and play free and and not feel that I, I'm a, and it, that I'm beholden to certain expectations. But I just want to say you did not repay me very well. I, I did make you, um, you, you come off great in the book, but you did not repay me. You played a mean trick on me, um, which I still think is one of the funniest things. But after you read my book, you sent me an email and, and I opened it on my, or I looked at it on my phone. And, you know, when you look on your phone, you can only see the headline or the subject line or something. And the subject line of Jeff's email to me after he'd read about himself in my book was just cease and desist. <laughs> <laughs> and my heart sank and I had a, I had a panic attack and I thought, Oh my God, I've offended him. And, um, uh, and the book was out I'm, or it was coming out. I think it was in gas. It was too late. And I told my editor this, this story in the exact same way and watched her have a heart attack for fun, you know, but then I opened the email and, and it was, you know, just this incredibly warm and, and kind um, message with, with a mean joke up top. But, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think that there's, when I'm thinking about your book, um, I think also, or, or I wonder, this is my question to you, if in part, the book is also about taking on different models and exploring different models in terms of thinking about one's inevitable end of their career or the end of art or the end of, of making. And I think something that's so impressive to me about, about your book is how many different models you take on and how um, deeply you engage with all these different ways to think about one's, you know, to sort of quote what you're talking about with Turner, one's last painting or, or in his case, he never made his last painting. And if that sort of exploration um, was sort of liberating to you in, in the way that I think taking on your model or Roger Federer's model or some of the philosophers that I write about in my book, taking on their model was in fact very liberating to me. Yeah, um, actually, as all, you, you always say so many great things, um, Chloe, that I need to go back to the beginning of this. And it's just as a general point, isn't it? it I'm a, I was I was aware it was a sort of high risk joke, that email, because <laughs> isn't it the sort of extraordinary thing that in real life, if we were together chatting away, we could be dead, you know, we could say things in a really deadpan way, not in that mm. kind of uh, I'm making a joke way, but we would both know it was funny. And it's extraordinary the 
ability of email to completely eliminate, uh, you know, it's actually best not to make jokes in, in email because uh, it's just, it's sort of a joke resistant uh, uh, medium. So I just add that as a, as a, as a, as a thought. So I'm glad that uh, I'm glad it, uh, it did engender that in that in, in initial horror. Uh, <laughs> um, this, uh, this thing of, freedom is is very important uh i think and as all tennis players say you know it's the you know you've got to be i mean roger says repeatedly this this ideal of a a, a state of intense concentration and equal relaxation very very difficult uh thing to achieve and in literature i think one of the things that i'm struck by is that i like this idea of a sort of free form, if you like, um, and I know we shouldn't use this uh, this forum to sort of bitch about reviews, but uh, this, I mean, it's fair to say, I think, that this book of mine had a lot of negative reviews, and the thing that most irked me was people saying it was unstructured, and it really wasn't. It had a beautiful, I think it had a beautiful uh, and unique to itself uh, structure, but it was not the kind of structure that um, uh, is sort of indicated by chapters or, and there's no, here's something I've come in increasingly to, to not like so much. These books now where the, the, in, the introduction serves as a sort of reheated version of the proposal that led to its being commissioned. Um, so it's sort of selling itself to the, to the reader, as it were. Whereas I like the idea of um, a book, the form of which is not announced in advance. And I think it's at the beginning of Michael Ondaatje's In the Skin of a Lion, when he says something like the first words of any novel should be um, something like, trust me, there is order here, but very faint. And I think we're accepting of that in fiction. And indeed, there's the Goldsmith Prize, which is uh, it's a UK prize, but it's designed to foster experimental or um, unusual writing. But it's funny, in nonfiction, I think there is much uh, that people want to sort of know what they're getting in, in advance. And I think it requires a kind of, um, yeah, a kind of patience and trust to um to see what kind of structure is operating. And I mean, I'm aware of how mistaken it would be for us to try to come up with tennis metaphors for everything. <laughs> but you know, I like this idea of a sort of, um, you know, um, also stylistically a kind of, um, um, you know, the sort of racket tension of it, of the, the style of it being loose, of it not being too, too up uptight as it were. So let's let me throw this back to you now. What about your? What's your relationship? With, with, how would you describe your relationship to to form and stylistic tension, as it were? What do you What do you string your books at? Well, I I thought a lot about um, being in very specific conversations with stru specific structures, but also specific traditions. So I think my book is um you know it it really maps exactly and precisely onto a quest narrative. There's 12 steps in, you know, in Joseph Campbell's um, quest narratives, and there's 12 chapters in my book. Um, I meet mentors and cross thresholds, but the mentors are like you and Roger Feder and Beyonce and Kant. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the, the thresholds are, are internal largely, but I thought about that, that tradition of the very classic quest narrative, the book, begins with me leaving home and ends with me returning home, but with new knowledge. And then I also thought about the history of travel narratives and where a body like mine, a life like mine was, was typically absent from those sorts of travel narratives and wanting to be very aware of, um, of it very intentionally entering the history of travel writing. So those were two things on sort of larger scales, tradition-wise, that I was thinking a lot about. But then on the more local level, form-wise, I I think that the, the driving force of the book is about perceptual change, about how, how it is that new information or experience or time allows us to quite literally perceive differently 
So on one, so on almost every single page of my book, there's an example of both small and large of major perceptual shifts. And my love of tennis actually came from desiring to really understand what I was seeing because the first time I was watching tennis, it seemed like the most boring thing on the whole planet, um, just a ball going over a net. And, and I couldn't see any of the strategy, the grace or the intention um, until I learned more about the sport and Roger Federer being sort of a great guide into that, a mentor into that, because he had an aesthetic power that I could appreciate before I understood what it meant in, in a sporting context. And so the way that perception can shift, that's that was an important structural, you know, sort of beating heart of the book because, bit, you know, the bigger idea of the book is wanting people's perception of a disabled body to shift. And, you know, to go back to something you were saying much earlier on, that also required most I mean, most intensely, my own perceptual shifts, because I have to be the person who is doing the most work in the book, um, not asking other people to do the most work. And I am the worst person in the book by by a mile or the most sort of um, confused or ethically questionable person in the book. And it's my own perceptual shifts that have to be the engine for asking anybody else's perceptual shifts to happen. So that happens throughout the book. And and is all sort of aiming at a, an intention. But one thing I was thinking about, I was thinking so much about the structure of your book. I'm so glad that you brought this up. We didn't plan this ahead of time, but I was thinking about it so much in, yes, it's freedom and it's in, you know, the sort of roving curiosity and the way that it feels at times like a constellation, but how each chapter has ligatures that lead us so intentionally from one section to another. But then I wanted to ask you, because I felt like maybe I'm projecting one thing on you. And so either you'll tell me that I'm projecting accurately or inaccurately, but I was rereading it. I read it when I got the galley very early from you. And then I was just rereading it this week in preparation to talk to you today. And I was, I was feeling so transported sort of psychically to the way my brain was processing information during COVID, which was anxiety was fueling me to sort of look at something and move. I was moving um, in a more staccato rhythm in terms of how I read, how I thought, and how I wrote longer sort of, you know, narratives that are building step by step by step. That didn't seem really possible. It didn't seem to fit the way that my brain was interacting with the reality of the world. And there is something in your book that feels, I don't know, like not like just outside of what you're writing about, like an important sort of time capsule of of that moment and the way that the mind processes the impossibility of an, you know, a global pandemic, but also of course content wise the impossibility and inevitability of what do you say you have such a beautiful line po the possibility of depression that you sink into that's so deep that it's indistinguishable from bliss <laughs> yeah. um and that's yeah what a beautiful thing but also an impossible thing to wrap one's mind around and one doesn't approach that in a straight line um those great profundities and so i feel that that's for me living underneath the structure of of your book as well um, and I'm curious if that resonates with you at all, or if that's just my, my projection. Yeah, sure thing. I mean, um, uh, again, though, I need to go back to something oh, you no. earlier, um, <laughs> because yeah, you, I mean, I, I completely accept your point about the, uh, the sort of quest narrative of, of your book. And of course that, uh, that's, uh, that that's about often uh, you know we we come across this as a form of literal uh, travel, but I think it's um, it's worth saying that it's possible to write as it were an intellectual travel book without leaving your room. And I love reading any kind of book whereby uh, I end up uh, in a very different place epistemologically by page two hundred and fifty. Uh, than I'd started out with on, on page one, even if that doesn't involve any physical journey at all. But 
I'm also aware of how useful the physical journey is, because as soon as you have, it seems to me, an actual physical journey, you've got inherent narrative interest. So the one I always cite with regard to this, because it's just such an extraordinary book, is uh, Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry. We start in Texas, we end up in, in Montana, and it's just incredible really the the narrative grip that you have that you have there and in the case of uh, the structure of my book I mean it really doesn't work like that we certainly don't start in Texas and end up in in Montana um, it's drifting sideways um, there's a lot of sort of associative stuff but I think something different is going on we all I was talking about reading your book and the sense of suspense, dreadful suspense I, 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 I had. Um, and of course, we like suspense, you know, in that sort of Hitchcockian way. Um, and I think in, in, in the structure of my book, the suspense is actually uh, takes the form of something like, is this, is this gonna, you know, is this going anywhere? You know, why have we moved from talking to, uh, about Gillian Welch, say, to Turin? And then it turns out there's a there's a there's a reason uh, for that, but it's not uh, it's not a straightforward what Milan Kundera calls it's not a bicycle race kind of narrative. And uh, gradually things fit together, and I think it's a question of trying to uh, attain some sort of balance between the successive, you know, page one is followed by page two by page three, and trying to hold uh, between that and the simultaneous whereby you want to hold certain things together I think also I'd like to go back Chloe to that kind of extraordinary thing you were describing whereby you know your the very nature of your book and your undertaking sort of caused me to appear in 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 Indian Wells and I think that's um there's something wonderful about book writing whereby at a certain part of when you're deeply into a book I mean everything seems to play into your hands and you know what uh, just the act of writing it causes things to come your way at exactly the right time I think it's a uh, it's partly to do with one's being in a state of such deep receptiveness and readiness to to sort of um uh to absorb material but also I'm conscious, and I, I think we can move on to discuss this, um, of the potential there for uh, for delusion. So as your, you know, uh, Nietzsche, when he was, when his marbles were starting to roll in Turin, you know, he has this idea of the uh, amor fate or, uh, you know, whereby everything that happens to you, you'd say, um, you know, you're not a victim of it, but you willed it. And there's a capacity for delusion there. So when he was getting really nutty, he said something like, you know, I only have to think of X or Y, and immediately a letter arrives from them in through the post. So one can see the sort of uh, the, 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 uh, the mania, uh, that the, there's a the potential for that there. But I think in terms of the larger themes of your book, I mean, uh, yeah, let's talk about this. How much of a, a figure for you? And you, you, you know, you're a, I'm a, an amateur reader of philosophy. You're a, you're a, you're a pro. I wonder just how, what, what Nietzsche means, means to you. Oh, interesting. Um, that's a great, you know, and I really admired your sections about Nietzsche and I actually learned so much about Nietzsche from you and from, um, from your book. I didn't know, uh, there's that story, which I now am going to get maybe wrong, but is so, it was so powerful in your book that I was like, somebody needs to make a film about this immediately of, of you saying the the true sort of end of Nietzsche's Nietzsche-ness or something, or one of the ends is a moment where he's walking somewhere and he sees somebody beating a horse and he goes and embraces the horse. And that's sort of a, a psychic rupture for him. And you explain that so beautifully um, and so powerfully. And I, I actually don't think I knew that story or if I knew it, I had forgotten it or it felt if I felt as though I was recountering, encountering it for the first time through you. So I want to just say, though, quickly, um, 
something about just delusion, because I actually think delusion is in many ways, one of the more underrated, um, helpful tools of the artist. <laughs> Uh, it's something we don't we don't talk about, or maybe you don't include in your your writing tips. Um, but I think delusion is like a key, help, very helpful aspect of. I mean, so many of the things that we write about, both of us, um, require a certain amount of delusion. I mean, we met because I had convinced myself with no prior knowledge that I could be GQ's tennis writer for a year if I just asked for it. And, and essentially that's exactly what happened. Or I went, you know, I just had this desire to meet Roger Federer and I thought I will, I'll just make it happen. Um, or I, you know, I go to a Beyonce concert with no real way of, of getting to the stage and sort of talk my way into it, um, out of some sort of delusional belief that if I understand the sort of social circumstances of the moment, um, well enough that, yeah, that that I can I can mold reality into my into the way that I want it to be, and I think that something that's so interesting in in your book all the way through it's sort of an undercurrent of so many of these conversations about about the ends of work and about Nietzsche and about I mean it, Turner about all, so much of the or that choice to retire is the line between what we might call productive delusion or motivating delusion mm. and destructive delusion mm. or the delusion that pulls us so far away from the center. And I wondered, yeah, I wonder how you conceptualize that line, that threshold. And if you feel like that sort of threshold between yeah, productive and destructive delusion is in many ways uh, a, a huge part of the architecture of your book. Yes, in, indeed. And, um, you know, it's one of the things, it seems to me, in terms of a, um, a long creative life, uh, we might as well restrict it to literature, I guess, um, quite often a condition of people being able to continue uh, writing uh, late into their life is that they are necessarily oblivious to what is very, very evident to the to to the to the reader, which is to say that they're not as good as they were, and we can think of so many uh, I- examples of this. I guess uh, an extreme one would be Hemingway, who, in terms of quantity, he was writing an enormous amount, uh, but one of the reasons he was writing so much was to keep the truth at bay, which is that he he, he couldn't do it anymore. So uh, an, uh, an event, I mean, there's all sorts of reasons why uh, Hemingway, I mean, Hemingway, uh, Hemingway, dro- Hemingway drove himself mad in, in, in all sorts of ways, as well as in inheriting this sort of almost like a curse, really, since his dad had had killed himself. I mean, so there are so many different ways of uh, that this can this can um, this can manifest, and um, and then there's the alternative, I guess, whereby you um, uh, you 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 stop at a certain point because you 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 recognize your own your own sort of um, your your own your own in, inability. But then I guess, well, this is, I think, a useful thing to uh, to discuss. Um, so I was just at this, um, this is going to take a bit of framing. I, well, last weekend, I was at this uh, Duke Joint Festival in Clarksdale, Mississippi. And it was wonderful. It was, it was um, amazing in all sorts of ways. And there's lots of the blues that I'm not really drawn to. Um, but... I mean, one of the things that does interest me a lot is the way that could it be that some kind of debility, um, an injury or a disability, a decline in your technical ability can in some way result in one's doing the best work of of one's life. So, I mean, there's various sort of examples of this, and we'll come back to the the blues people shortly, but it's something that I've never really been able to sort of clarify. But, you know, if we take Maria Callas, you know, the ultimate tragic diva, and whose life was so, you know, 
the, 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 there's such a small gap really between her life and the heroine she's uh, she's uh, enacting. And I just cherish this idea that maybe Callas's greatest performance could have performances could have been after the voice was past its best. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's something so sort of uh, there's some we so we uh, we cherish some ameliorative idea even in the midst of uh, even in 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 the in the midst of what what's obviously uh, a, a decline. Uh, maybe I'll hand over to you at that point before reverting to the blues momentarily. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that any sort of obstacle. Um, gives us an opportunity to be resilient. I think that's something with disability. Disability is almost always framed by others as uh, some sort of, you know, thing to be pitied and, and feared. But for me, as living my whole life as a disabled woman, I've seen it as one of the greatest tools of agency of my life because it's forced me to be tremendously resilient, but also innovative and, um, and, uh, and you know, figuring out ways over obstacles reveals a lot of strength that um, other things can't gift you. But I think another the thing that's so that can be so valuable for all of us when we go through any sort of physical challenges or differences or illnesses or any of the things is that it can break us free of an understanding of a fixed role. Mm -hmm. And so. I, you know, I think in some ways my body making me different breaks me free of certain types of fixed expectations or roles that I might take on. And if you're free of that, because people aren't putting you in the same box as they're putting every other woman that looks like you, then you get to play more. You get to do more. I mean, it, it enhances a sort of freedom. If you have a, a strict narrative of how your life is supposed to go, or people are telling you a version of, you know, this is the right way to be a a tennis journalist or the right way to be an artist or something, um, you're sort of broken free from, from a fixed role and then something new can come forth. And one example, I think this is different than, I mean, you write about the body in, in your book, but I think this is a little different. I take so much inspiration from your essay and I can't remember which book it is where you're, you're meant to write about Gauguin, I believe. Oh, yeah. And you buy this gigantic um, biography of, of him and you think this is what's going to, allow me to do the work I'm supposed to do. And then you immediately lose it in an airport. And instead of that being the worst thing that happens, it's the actual thing that frees up the work. And it, cause it pops you out of a certain fixed expectation, which is I'm going to be a good journalist who reads the book and goes and looks at the things and reports on the things from a position of all that, you know, it gives um, a freedom to create something that nobody else would have written and I think of any sort of real obstacle as, as having that double-edged gift to it. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting a warning and we're getting some questions soon. So do you so want to respond to that or go into to uh, our I, excellent questions? Yes, I'm aware of the huge distraction of the chat. So I'll just reply to one part yeah. of that. Um, you know, to an extent... Uh, there's uh, you could one could say that sort of non-fiction books quite often you feel they could be written by anyone what distinguishes a particular instance of it is the author's knowledge of the subject and sure enough we go to non-fiction quite often because we want to know about the subject and of course there's nothing nothing wrong with that but I'm thinking that with my own non-fiction book books every time I've written one uh, I've uh, I always keep a kind of little book of um, a, a sort of self-help book to my, you know, in notes to self. And always I write in it, remember, write the book that only you can write. Yeah. Um, and by that, what I'm actually doing is sort of saying to myself, remember, utilize your weaknesses, your inadequacies, your ignorances and your limit and the contingencies of your own experience, as opposed to writing the book that one could write if one had achieved a state of sort of omniscience and complete mastery of, of the subject. And without wishing to boast, what I would say is that it requires a kind, a certain kind of confidence and courage to uh, to uh, to do that, because 
yeah, you're making your 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 weaknesses very uh, very very public. But God, yeah. time really has just as the last six years have flown by, Chloe. So this uh, this conversation has. So maybe now we should. Uh, I think we yeah. Well, yeah. We I just want to say, and then I'll ask you some of these questions that I think that is the, the precisely the thing that I'm trying to capture in the book when I encounter you is you're saying it takes a kind of bravery. And I think that to, to write the way that you're talking about, I think very specifically what a lot of your work gifts us is, um, is that the, the type of bravery one must have is a bravery to face themselves and to look at themselves, because the only way to write singularly from the self is to look at all the parts that you just listed off your your strengths your weaknesses your knowledge the gaps of knowledge um your fears and to see see those things without a negative valence which i think is a huge thing that your work does is sees those moments of what other people might might interpret as weakness or fear or or mistakes or whatever um as part of the story and and as part of the like rich and fertile soil from which the singular voice can can spring and i think that's that's been a tremendous guide that i'm so grateful for and and i'm always trying to get a little bit better at um so i thank you for that and now i'm going to ask you because i'm looking at these questions okay mm. why why do we write about tennis are we trying to convert non tennis fans and is there any other sport that captures passion your passion in the same way do you think are we trying to convert people um, no, I'm not. And I think tennis is actually rather difficult to write about. I mean, David Foster Wallace, uh, pretty much the best writer on tennis. Uh, I, I don't know, that's something we could discuss. He talks about his um, disappointment when he's reading Tracy Austin's uh, autobiography. Yeah. That she <laughs> She's so boring. <laughs> yeah, now, you know, she says, I hit a cross court and then I hit one down the line. But actually, the truth is that's what tennis comes down to. Uh, that that's it. So it's actually better to watch it on TV than to write about it. So um, I actually think um, so. There's not a huge amount of great writing on tennis, I think. Whereas there is an amazing amount of great writing about boxing, mm -hmm. which is quite interesting, given that as um, uh, Joyce Carol Oates writes in her brilliant book uh, on boxing, you know, it, what happens in a boxing ring is happening at a place beyond words. But weirdly, there's been a lot of words in that in that place. Uh, you should respond to that question also, uh, of course, Chloe. Well, my response is I actually got to ask Roger what he thought of David Waster, David Foster Wallace's piece on oh. him, the very famous piece. And his response was, yeah, he got a lot out of the five minutes we talked. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and I thought that's perfect. You know, he described meeting him for five minutes inside of the you know, ATP office and uh, that being it. And, and he says, you know, I don't remember him at any of the press conferences or at any, which he might've been there, who knows, but, um, but Roger said, yeah, I talked to him for about five minutes and then he got, and I thought that's probably the best way to write about tennis is actually with, um, without much, <laughs> without much contact with Tra the Tracy Austins of the world, but instead, um, just sort of retreating into, into deep imagination, but also, um, attention to crowds and attention to the people that are watching it, which I think he was very good at. Um, but so, I just yeah. Jump in there about Foster Wallace, it's I mean, it's a yeah. great essay, but it's it, the interesting thing about it, I think, is that if you talk about a stylistic affinity between the writer and the subject, he was such an unfederer like writer. He mm. had much stylistically, he had much more in common with Nadal and his endless ticks and obsessive compulsion. So stylistically, Foster Wallace was always pulling his pants out of his ass yeah. and whipping <laughs> into all, all this kind of stuff. So I think there was that lovely irony there. Let me, uh, I, I'll read the next question. In a playful rules in a real sense, it's almost like this discussion was written into manifestation. Uh, yes. blah, blah, blah. Is there another event or a person that you've written into manifestation? I think that's a good one for, for you, um, Chloe. Yeah, I, I feel like my whole book is sort of a bizarre, yeah, some bizarre manifestation in that, yeah, I watched Roger Federer on when the Australian Open and I thought I just every once in a while I come into these moments of of having this the most intense 
feeling, I guess I, I think of it often as kinship. And then I try to think, well, what is, what is kinship in these sort of circumstances when I feel this sort of kinship to an artist um, and we can, you know, artist being able to interpret that word as broadly as possible. And I think maybe the closest I can get to it is every once in a while I encounter somebody's work, whether it be an athlete or a musician um, or a friend um, or, or a writer like Jeff is um, I have a sense that there's something I desperately want to know, something I desperately want to learn. And that in a way I'm standing at the threshold um, of that knowledge. And the only way through the threshold is if this other person opens the door for me. And I think it's just when I have that feeling, I I'm sort of like a dog with a bone. I just go after it as intensely as possible because I think the kind of knowledge that I am able to acquire from, um, from people who are committed to making things in the world is it's one of the, maybe the strongest things that keeps me alive. However, I will say that as true as I think everything I just said is, I really believe everything I just said. I also think there's some retroactive delusion, you know, that <laughs> that plays a role in this too, and sort of going like, I, you know, I made Jeff Dyer appear. Well, also I went to the <laughs> tournament as to where he lives and he likes tennis, and you know, maybe it was <laughs> sort of not that strange to see you of all writers there, but um, and yeah, so. I don't know. Have you ever manifested anybody? You feel? Well, the sort. Of, I mean, we would have to go for the most extreme example. We'd have to go way back in time to 1989 when uh, I wrote this novel, The, the Color of Memory, uh, and I invented a sister for myself because I'm an only child and I'd always wanted a sister. And anyway, and then um, and then uh, I met somebody that I fell in love with who was. Uh, you know, really had many of the same characteristics of this uh, this invented sister. So um, that uh, that would be uh, that that's a very distant version of that. Um, let's see, we've got another one here. So um, I expect it's easiest if we read it out loud, isn't it? When it comes to including yourself as a character in your writing. Jeff's remark, those I write about, no one looks worse than me or something. Say more mm -hmm. about the fine line between self-depreciation and being honest with one's representation of self on the page. Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. That's Would you like great. to start with that? And while you're talking, I will try to process an answer too. Oh, okay. I will <laughs> if you want to start. You're more yeah, you're, I, you're quicker witted than me, Chloe. Uh, well, that's not true. There is <laughs> there is a moment in my book I, which really doesn't serve any purpose. I tried to make my book very intentional and to make very hard cuts, but there is one part in the book that that is um, me making Jeff laugh with a joke that has absolutely no business being in the book, except that I wanted to memorialize that I had once made you laugh, which was um, I'd come out of a press conference with Roger Federer and I had actually gotten to ask is the first time I'd ever spoken to him and, and asked a question. And I said, you know, oh my, I was so scared. And I, you know, the, it, the moment felt so terrifying to me. Um, I felt like time expand, you know, and I felt sort of my core self fleeing. And, and then I said to you, you know, I, I, I as soon as I got called on, I lost my English altogether. And you said, oh, that's it. Wait, what's your, you know, what's your first language? And I said, oh, it's English. <laughs> you sort of, you sort of gave me a laugh and I was like, that's going to go in the book. I don't care. Yeah. Um, but that's not answering the question. The, I think my answer to the question is um, I, in anything I'm writing, I'm really thinking about what I'm asking of my reader, what I want them to either, what insight I want us to move toward or what thing in them I want to expand or question or challenge. And I think that I instinctively feel I know when I'm reading um, a work by an artist who's just telling me to do that or who's instructing yeah. me on on how how I ought to be or how I ought to think. And, um, you know, a, a particular area of my personality is that I reject that immediately <laughs> and shut off. But when somebody, when an artist is willing to go on that journey with me and ask me, ask themselves most stringently the, you know, the the sort of challenges that they're putting on someone else, they're putting on themselves first and foremost. 
then I feel like I'm with a person. I feel like I'm being communicated with. And those are the things that, um, that are most expansive. But I think the way this question is formulated is really important because they're saying, you know, you, you one must pay attention to that fine line between self-deprecation and being honest. And I do think that self-deprecation is, um, you know, like the Janus face other other side of the coin of um, self-absorption and and deep vanity. So yeah. I think it is very important to to un, to root out things that are pure self-deprecation because that's performative. Um, and I don't I don't really want performative things in in my work. What I want are deeply probing, searching things, and that means sometimes uncovering the darker corners of, of myself, but, but still require, as Jeff said so beautifully, really trying to look at the self as whole um, and from that wholeness uh, to speak. And that's not something that I think, I, I think with every single book or every single piece I write, it's a new challenge. It's a new and evolving challenge to locate that threshold. And I think the challenge as you age and as experience changes you, um, that also changes the threshold. And so it's not one that I think any good artist feels that they have a firm grasp of, but rather that they're always looking for. Uh, well, I've realized now, um, Chloe, I made a mistake by asking you to go first because that was a <laughs> good answer. I think all I can add is a, a slight PS to it, really, uh, which is uh, this, really, that um, I think... Uh, yeah, there's uh, I mean, what you say about self depreciation and over, uh, and self confidence is absolutely absolutely right. Uh, I'll add something slightly different, really. That I think even although, of course, I appear, I make quite a lot of this kind of you know, I appear, I've got this persona, this gangling kind of you know whatever, and that, you know, I appear in quite a quite a lot of the books. But what I would say is even in the books, when I don't make, as it were, a personal appearance physically, I'm there all the time. And this is something which I've become more uh, uh, conscious of because it's this question of authorial consciousness. And of course, that is manifest, not just in terms of your worldview, which is, of course, on the big scale, but it's there syntactically and at the level of punctuation. And it's all it's all saturating. Uh, and so I think that's the, the 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 sort of the key thing. And folded into that is this idea of, of, of self-depreciation. And I think maybe there are um there's, I mean, what I'm sort of emphatically rejecting, I think, is is this idea of um sort of self-aggrandizement, really. There's a difference between that and self-confidence. And just to sort of link it in, just to enlarge it a bit, because we were uh, in the sort of notes that we we were sent that we talk, might talk about our what we're reading. I mean, I'm now I'm sort of working my way through steadily uh, the works of Anita Bruckner, and mm. as we all know, you know they're pretty much all the same though, those those books. And if you asked me, you know, am I interested in sort of lonely middle aged women living in mansion blocks in London? My honest response would be I'm actually far more interested as a subject matter. I'm much more interested in the battle for Iwo Jima. Um, but uh, it doesn't matter, though, because these books of uh, Bruckner's, I've read maybe a third of the 24. Uh, so I've read about eight of them. It's that complete saturation of uh, of the of each book in Bruckner's consciousness. And that to me is is, is endlessly fascinating she doesn't appear in them uh, uh, physically, except she's there, ab absolutely there on every page. Time has moved on quickly again. Uh, oh, yes. And, We've, yeah. We're uh, down to our last minute. I, I guess we should answer this last question, which feels like yeah. a, one one we could answer in a minute, which is, uh, do you have any current tennis mm -hmm. muses at the moment? And I, my question I'd add on to that is, at one point in your book, you talk about sort of life going on and tennis going on. And you say, I don't miss Roger. You recognize for a moment, at least, that you don't miss him. And I guess I right. wonder, but do you miss him? Well, that was a, a particular moment when yes. I said that, when like everyone in the world, I was so in love with Emma Raducanu. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that was so magical. And uh, 
you know, I don't want to join. I mean, it's uh, let's let's put it like this. If I'm not missing uh, Roger now, uh, I don't think it's because uh, Emma Raducanu has continued to uh, uh, um, to uh, mm -hmm. absorb our attention. Do you know, I think my interest in tennis is really going to I don't think it will. Uh, it will not uh, attain the same level that it did with uh, with Roger, um, even though, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, what's his name? Alcaraz is incredibly yeah. exciting. I think Roger was a sort of once in a lifetime thing for me. And I'm really I'm just aware that I'm spending less time watching tennis. I didn't go to Indian Wells this year. And uh, yeah, it's 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 peaked. It peaked for me with Roger. How about how about you, Chloe? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, when people talk about the greatest of all time, which is maybe sort of a irrelevant conversation and, and in some ways, and they always say, you know, sort of always look at the slam count. I find the slam count, um, which Roger no longer holds the most slams. I find that actually kind of irrelevant to me. And in, in the question of the greatest of all time, I think about impact. I think about um, the capturing of an imagination and I don't, I mean, I, I like Alcaraz too, and and I try to watch some, but I don't I don't feel that it's likely that in my lifetime someone will truly move me or capture my imagination in quite the same way. Um, and I think that is a, a form of greatness that that matters more to me than you know what can be captured on a scoreboard. So, like so um, am I right in th oh, so we've got to stop now? And uh, am I right in thinking, Chloe, that we just say, well, we thank you, we thank everyone for listening. It's been a joy, as always, speaking with you, Chloe. And then we, then I think we just sign we off and we just assume we assume there's a standing ovation, even though we can't see it. <laughs> right? Yes, <laughs> I can hear it. I can hear it in my head. Yeah, yeah. I can my feel it vibration. Me. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Um, yeah, and I, I've just loved this time talking to you. So thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Okay, everyone. Thank you all. Bye-bye.